This is going to be a study on how Christians should treat other Christians. And I'm going to get right into it and say, number one, don't fruit inspect each other. Philippians 1 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Notice here in Philippians 1 6 that Paul was confident in the salvation of the Philippians that he was writing to. And you have Christians today going around inspecting each other and deciding whether or not another Christian is even saved. And I believe a man is saved when he realizes he is a guilty sinner and his own self-righteous works can't save him. And then he comes to Jesus Christ and believes on him as his crucified, buried, and risen Savior. And that is what saves a person. If a person tells me he's done that, then I'm not going to look for his fruit so I can decide whether he is saved or not. And I can't see his heart. I don't have super spiritual eyes. And these Christians who fruit inspect each other end up coming up with their own set of standards to judge whether a person is saved or not. They will make a list of do's and don'ts for a true Christian. And the list will always be the Christian has to do what they do. And if they don't do what they do, then they're not saved. If they don't buy, go by these guidelines, then they really didn't get saved to begin with. They look for fruit that they can see outwardly, even though the regeneration is spiritual and the flesh didn't get born again. Many times Christians will fruit inspect other Christians and say, well, he's not as spiritual as me because he doesn't go soul winning as much. Or he didn't read his Bible as much as he did, as I did this year. Or he didn't do such and such as much as I did. When all they are really doing is going against the Bible themselves. Because if you look at 2 Corinthians 10.12, it says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and com comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So they compare everyone to their own set of standards. And this is how they judge whether or not a person is saved or not. I heard a man say the other day, if a man continues in sins after being saved, he really didn't get saved. He must not be saved then because he sins every day too. We all do. And there are sins called bad thoughts, worrying, being puffed up because of your Bible knowledge, looking down on Christians like you're more superior. And you can be so full of yourself, and that's a sin. You can continue in pride your whole Christian life. And this man's immediate response to what I'm saying would be, well, you believe in easy believism. He'd say, you think a man can be saved and then just go live how he wants to. And that's when he will sound like a true holiness preacher or a Church of Christ preacher or all these people with eternal insecurity. They say the same thing. He just has the Baptist version of it. The Baptist version of this is if a person is still sinning, then he really didn't get saved. That's their way of adding works. Uh, while the holiness crowd thinks you are kept saved by living right, the Baptist version is if you get saved and don't live right, then you just really didn't get saved. I believe a Christian should live right, but it's not my job to go around and fruit inspect about who's saved and who isn't saved. I believe a man is saved by believing the gospel, not by repeating a prayer that he doesn't even mean. I believe a man is saved when he comes to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that he is and puts his trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ to save him. And if that is easy believism, 
then I guess I believe easy believism. I don't believe the Bible teaches for me to inspect everyone's fruit. And you can run to Matthew 7 if you would like, but the context is referring to a false prophet who comes to you in sheep's clothing, not to a born-again believer in the body of Christ. I believe I should inspect myself. I know what's going on inside me. I know that I'm saved. I don't know what's going on inside you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not in your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Do I believe everyone who claims to be saved is really saved? Absolutely not. Do I believe a person who doesn't even understand what they are saying when they pray a sinner's prayer really gets saved? No. And do I think a Christian should live like a wicked person and not even try to do right? No, I don't. But I'm well aware a Christian has two natures. He still has a sinful flesh, and he can live for the flesh to the point that you can't tell he even has a new man living inside. And you can't always go by outward evidence. And if all you're doing is looking for outward evidence, there are lost people who can fake it. And lost people who look pretty good on the outside will deceive you into thinking that they're saved. And that is why Jesus Christ talked about men who looked good outwardly, but inwardly they were full of dead men's bones. That is why the false prophets looked good outwardly with sheep's clothing, but inwardly they were wolves. And these guys go around saying there are some sins a Christian just won't commit. And they have no idea what they're talking about. They know Paul teaches eternal security and they can't get around the fact of that. But they are still trying their hardest to get works involved in salvation. That is the temptation of man. And the other temptation is to look at everyone's fruit to decide whether they are saved or not, and to, de to decide if they are as a good of a Christian as they are. So they'll come up with a list of standards saying, you're not a true Christian if you did this, you're not a true Christian if you did that. And you can't determine someone's salvation on what they've done in the flesh. And a lot of times this looking for fruit ends up with them looking for dirt on another Christian so they can go and expose them openly and ruin the other Christian's testimony or their ministry all because they're jealous of that person or because they just don't like that person or because that person is actually seems more spiritual than they are and they're envying that person. So don't fruit inspect other Christians. And I'd also like to say Talk to each other without strife. And you'll see a lot of preachers today who can't talk or even have a message without strife. Second Timothy 2.24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Do you want to be a true servant for the Lord? Then don't strive. Meaning don't start bickering and arguing arguing with everyone over every little thing. Proverbs fifteen eighteen says, A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Proverbs twenty and verse three, it is an honor for a man to seize from strife, but every fool will be meddling. Proverbs twenty six twenty where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tailbearer, the strife ceaseth. Proverbs twenty six twenty one: As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. A contentious man. Uh, Proverbs twenty eight twenty five: He that is of a proud heart steereth up strife. So it takes a proud heart to steer up strife. But he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. Proverbs twenty nine twenty two: An angry man steereth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. 
And in Galatians 5.20, it calls strife a work of the flesh. Philippians 1.15 says, Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. Philippians 2.3, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. James 3.16, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So a person that is causing strife, he has a proud heart, he's an angry man, he's giving in to the works of the flesh, he's got a lot of envy towards people, and he's wanting glory instead of God getting glory. Those are common things, characteristics of someone who causes a lot of strife according to the Bible. Many Christians love to talk about the deep doctrines of the Bible, but they can't master these practical things in the Bible, practical Christian living. An angry man stirreth up strife, and there are many Christians that can't have a conversation with anyone or another Christian without arguing about something. And when a lost person sees two Christian people mouthing off at one another back and forth, he can't help but think, these Christians can't even agree with each other, so why would I get saved? And it starts off with envy, and then comes the strife. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. And I watch a lot of King James Bible preachers, and I listen to a lot of Bible preachers. And many of them that I listen to are constantly going back and forth with each other. And it's like seeing two kids fight one another because they are just so jealous of each other all the time. And one of them will envy the other one because he has more followers or took some of his followers. And then he will begin to search that man's ministry and his sermons for a false belief that that preacher might have. And then he will preach a message against that man and call him a heretic because he disagrees with him on something non-essential. And this is causing strife and division. 1 Corinthians 3 3 says, For ye are not for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? All these Christians who think they're so spiritual because they don't drink and fornicate or smoke or listen to rock music are just as carnal as anyone else. They boast about having a changed life when their heart is nasty. They are full of strife and they are full of rage. All they want to do is argue back and forth about doctrine. And it is almost like they are trying to be the greatest, the greatest Bible teacher. And they need to read Mark nine thirty three through 35 and let it sink in. It says in Mark nine thirty three, And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, This is Jesus, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And many Christians will argue about things that don't even have to do with the Bible. They will break fellowship over the dumbest things. And one of the greatest things you can learn as a Christian is to get over your minor disagreements. And don't cause a bunch of strife among yourselves because someone is doing something you don't like. The reason you can't do this is because you're full of self. You need to get over yourself. But if you're trying to be the greatest... And for this reason, you have a lot of envy and jealousy towards others, and it's causing strife. Remember what that verse said, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last. And next, I want to say, talk to each other with respect. 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2 says, Rebuke not an elder, elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. 
So a younger Christian shouldn't rebuke an older Christian. And if you have a disagreement, then kindly show him your position and be open to hear why he believes his position. At the same time, though, the verse said to entreat the younger men as brethren. The older men should treat the younger men with respect, just like the younger men should treat the older men with respect. Just because you have been saved 40 years doesn't make you a superior Christian to someone that's been saved two years. You're in the same body. You're both members of the body of Christ. And it's pathetic to see a seasoned Bible teacher or preacher look down on less knowledgeable Christians. And many times these men are afraid to be questioned by other Christians. And when they are questioned, they will show their pride and start calling people names and getting upset. And the other day I heard a very seasoned Bible teacher look down on newer Christians who were just asking him questions and trying to learn something. And he called them lightweights with short attention spans and bratty children and a bunch of other nonsense. And yes, I know Jesus called people names, but remember who he was talking to. He was talking to the Pharisees. And a lot of these guys aren't as superior and as spiritual as they think. They forget what God brought them out of. And they forget that all the knowledge they have, God gave it to them and they didn't start out that way. They aren't anything special. Uh, Romans thirteen eight says, O oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. First Thessalonians four nine says, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And it's not showing love to call each other names in a hateful way. And a lot of these guys have no grace and no patience toward anyone. And First Thessalonians 5.14 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. You need to have patience and love toward each other, and then you're not going to call each other names because maybe they don't know as much as you know. A good Bible teacher or Christian mentor is going to be patient with newer and less knowledgeable Christians. And when they ask Christians he, questions, he shouldn't laugh at the questions or put them down or call them names. He may be just as much of a baby in Christ as they are if he does do those things. He's just a really smart baby. And there are baby geniuses. He knows a lot of Bible, but can't even practice the practical things in the Bible. He can give an outline of the events in Revelation, yet he can't sit in a room with another Christian for five minutes without arguing or mocking them. And that's being a big, overgrown baby. And next, we should pray for each other. Colossians 1, 3 through 4 says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. When is the last time you heard these angry, wrathful, hateful preachers and teachers say something like Paul said here in Colossians 1, 3, and 4? They don't love anyone but their self. They don't care about anyone but their self. And it is all about promoting their ministry so that they can be the greatest. And if you listen to as much preaching as I listen to and as many different teachers and stuff you will see a pattern. These guys feel like they have to go after a big shot preacher and ruin his ministry, and then it makes them feel like they reached another level and became closer to being the greatest. And what if they put their minor differences aside and just prayed for each other? Maybe get together as King James Bible believers and do something to glorify God together. Uh, I was in shock... A few months back, I heard a preacher sing a hymn with his congregation. And then after the song, he screamed for a, another certain preacher to go to hell. Even if he believes that that preacher is unsaved, that still isn't Christian conduct. That's not a way a Christian should act. Paul wasn't telling men to go to hell. 
and he actually wished himself accursed if he could get men saved who were the enemies to the gospel. Romans 9.3, Paul says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. His kinsmen, according to the flesh, were the Jews. And they are called enemies concerning the gospel in Romans 11 by Paul. Yet he would go to hell if they would get saved. He isn't going to tell someone to go to hell because he disagrees with them on what shape the earth is or when the rapture takes place. If you believe someone is unsaved, then pray that they get saved. If someone is in sin, pray that they get out of that sin. If someone is teaching something false, pray that they get it right. Don't be such a rotten example of a Christian and be such a Pharisee and scream for them to go to hell. Especially behind your pulpit in front of your students and followers who look up to you for guidance. Galatians 5.15 says, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. There can't be much praying for each other when you are biting and devouring each other. And there can't be much praying going on when you can't quit gossiping about each other. And that's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, And that ye study to be quiet. That means learn to shut up and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. If you'll watch your tongue and start working yourself, you're going to have a lot less time to badmouth everyone else that isn't doing as good as you are. And next I want to say we should show the fruits of the Spirit toward each other. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And a lot of Christians today ignore this part of Scripture in Galatians. They have no idea what it means to be gentle. They don't understand you can be a manly Christian, but yet gentle at the same time, so they are overly macho to the point that it's fake, and they are so tore up that someone is going to be greater than them that they can't show love, joy, and peace. They are rather full of hate, misery, and strife, and if another Christian says something harsh or mean to you, then just answer them back softly. Because Proverbs 15, 1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Don't worry about getting revenge with words. Let God take care of that person. God will chastise them for their sin, and you won't do anything but cause more anger. I'm always surprised how quick some people are to try and ruin another person's ministry. It's almost like they are trying to kill off other Bible believers so that they can conquer their territory and continue the building of their own kingdom. Although they may be premillennial, it's almost like they are postmillennial the way they are trying to build such a big kingdom for themselves on earth here. And you can be reading the Bible every day and still not have your affection on things above. If you're only reading the Bible for the purpose of becoming the greatest then you're not going to get as much out of it. And next I want to say, Christians should compliment other Christians. In 1 Thessalonians 1.8, Paul compliments the Thessalonians. He says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. So notice that Paul recognized the faith of the Thessalonians and commends them for their work in the Lord. And you know why you don't hear some preachers acknowledge or promote another preacher or another Christian? It's because they're trying to be the greatest. And they would never compliment another Christian. They want to be the best. They don't want anyone to get recognition but them. They don't even want Jesus Christ to have preeminence and get any recognition. If you realize that you and other Christians 
should all be on the same team with the same goal, which is to glorify God and get God praise, then it will make it easy to compliment each other. It will make it easier to be happy for one another when God blesses another person with something. And I've always liked to bring people together. I love to see one of my Christian brothers become friends with another one of my Christian friends. And if I could find, if if I find a good preacher or teacher with a good ministry, good sermons and studies and things like that, then I try to introduce my pastor or other friends t- to this ministry. God has placed teachers and preachers everywhere, and all of these people are individuals with different approaches to how they do things, and we should get blessed off each other's ministries. And if a person is right on the gospel and right on the King James Bible, then we shouldn't bash that person. But this has been how to treat other Christians. And I hope that you will apply these things to your life, and you will see that you're going to get along a lot better with other Christians.